Good morning and welcome to our sixth session with the uh, walkthrough. And I'm going to ask Derek Krieger if he would come up here and help me with something. So Derek, if you want to put on your tennis shoes <coughs> and run up here. What we have in this cup is ten pennies and a little tray for Derek to roll these things into, kind of like rolling a dice. And we're going to see how long it takes him to, to make these things all come up heads in one roll, all right? Uh, there, Derek, we're gonna have to, Bryce, we're going to have to try this again. No. Nope. Got to have them all come up heads. Maybe if roll them higher, from higher up, maybe that'll do it. No, nope. no, nope, not that time either. Really, Bryce, how long is this going to take? No. Nope. All right, one more time. Ooh, that was close. That was very close. Looky there. All heads but one. Wow. Tell you what, you take this back and you practice it throughout the week. <laughs> Tell me how long that takes, all right? Give him a hand. Those people that work with laws of probability say that Bryce will have to roll those somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand times before they will all come up heads. Now, imagine that each one of those pennies represented a prediction about something that was going to happen hundreds of years in advance. Imagine that those ten pennies represent ten predictions about a person that was going to come in the future <clears throat> And he was going to make all of those predictions come true perfectly. Would that be, in your mind, coincidence? Or would it be convincing proof that the person who made those predictions was pretty impressive? How about if we made it 20 predictions? How about if we made it 30 how about if we went up to 50 predictions, all of them coming true perfectly? Folks, what if I told you that Jesus Christ, when he came here and lived on this earth, he fulfilled over 300 specific prophecies in his life that had been made about him hundreds of years in advance. The life of Jesus Christ and this book that we call the Bible bears testimony to the supernatural character of the God who wrote it, the nature of this book, and this man that we call Jesus Christ and what he did for you and me. And this morning, I would like for us to take a look at one of those prophecies that was made about Jesus Christ because it ties in specifically with this study that we've been doing on the Abrahamic Covenant. And it... Um, it talks about this very thing that we've been looking at in relationship to God's program for the nation of Israel. But let's review real quickly. We have said that you, to understand the Bible, you have to understand the Abrahamic covenant. And in that covenant, that agreement that God made with Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, he promises him three things, land, people, and blessing. And we have said that that this agreement really ties the whole Bible together, both in terms of its history and in terms of its theme. But then we said that God takes each one of these individual aspects of the Abrahamic covenant and he further develops them or explains them in three more covenants. So the land promises are further developed in what we know as the Palestinian covenant given to us in Deuteronomy chapter 28 through 30. And in that covenant, God says, hey, the land is yours. I've given you the title deed to it. But if you want to enjoy living in it, I want you to obey me. And we tracked this out, and we saw that God has done exactly what he said he would do, that he would tear them from the land, he would scatter them, he would make them few in number, but he said he would bring them back, and we're seeing that happen, that he's bringing them back to the land right now. Now, there's one part of that agreement that still hasn't happened yet, and that is when they experience this national conversion when Jesus Christ returns. Now, the people in the king promises are further developed and further explained in what we know as the Davidic covenant given to us in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 
And in that covenant, God says to David, your descendants will always have the right to rule over my people. And we saw that the ultimate fulfillment of that is Jesus Christ. Right there in Luke chapter 1, Jesus Christ comes and he presents himself to them, presents himself to them as their king, and they reject him. So Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, you've rejected me. So this dynasty, this house that I came to fulfill is going to be left desolate and barren until the day that I return. And then you will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the blessing part of the, of the Abrahamic covenant is further developed and explained in what we refer to as the new covenant given to us in Jeremiah chapter 31. And we took a look at this last week in which God is saying to the nation of Israel, listen, sometime in the future, I'm going to relate to you in a different way than I have related to you in the past when I use the old Mosaic covenant. In the future, I'm going to put my spirit inside of every one of you. I'm going to provide forgiveness of sins, and every one of you is going to have a personal relationship with me. But Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11 that because the nation of Israel rejected their Messiah, they have been temporarily set to the side and God is going to the Gentiles to offer you and me the opportunity to live in this new covenant relationship so that you and I, through faith in Jesus Christ, can experience the indwelling presence of God the Holy Spirit. We can have the forgiveness of sins. We can have a personal relationship with God. But the nation of Israel isn't going to experience this until sometime in the future when Jesus Christ returns. So everything about the Abrahamic covenant points towards the second coming of Jesus Christ. So one of the questions that often comes up is, does the Bible give us any help in understanding what some of these events are that are just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ? Does the Bible talk about those kind of things very much? And the answer is yes, but it doesn't give us as much as you, would, you and I would like because we want dates and places and names and events, those kind of things. And the Bible gives us general information that's valuable to us as we look forward to that time. And it just doesn't give us as much as we would like. But I would like for us to take a look at one of these predictions that God gives concerning these events that are going to take place right before the second coming of Jesus Christ that also ties in to this whole story of Abraham's descendants. So if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. We're going to read a few verses that we looked at a few weeks ago, just to kind of set the stage here. And then we will uh, move on from there. So Matthew chapter 23, um, Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives, this is four days in front of the crucifixion. So his life is about over. Uh, he's been rejected, and he makes this statement. Somebody read verses 37 and 38. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her? How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. Okay, remember we read this, your house, that dynasty that he came to fulfill because he was a descendant of David, he says that's going to be left desolate and barren and empty to you. But then he goes on in verse 39 and he says, For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus acknowledges that sometime in the future when he comes again, they will recognize him as their Messiah. All right, remember that? Okay, somebody read chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Okay, they're walking out of the temple, and they're looking at this structure. We're talking about Herod's temple here. Solomon's temple had been destroyed back in 586 B.C., Herod had come on the scene, and he had spent like 35 years constructing this temple. It was a masterpiece, folks. And Jesus looks at this temple, and he says to his disciples, this thing's going to get torn apart stone by stone. 
Now, an interesting story. When the Roman general Titus came in 70 AD and he fulfilled this prediction, okay, he, he leveled the city of Jerusalem and took the, the temple apart. But before he attacked the city, he specifically told his, dis, his uh, army, he says, leave the temple alone. Because he knew that the temple was an architectural masterpiece. But somehow in all the chaos of the fighting, a fire broke out in the temple and it melted the gold and the silver so that it ran down into the cracks of the stones and his soldiers, in their greed for the metal, tore the temple apart stone by stone. So even though Titus had told his soldiers to not touch it, Jesus' prediction came true. All right? Um, so in just a matter of a few minutes here, Jesus had said, the dynasty is going to be left empty, but I'm going to return someday in the future, and this temple is going to be torn apart stone by stone. So that creates some questions in the minds of the disciples, right? So when they get a few minutes, they pull them off to the side, and they ask these questions in verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Okay, they ask him three questions. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now that first question, when will these things be, go directly back to his statement about the temple. He said he's going to come back, but before then the temple is going to get torn back, and they want to know, when, this, when is this going to happen? Well, Jesus doesn't answer that question here in Matthew. In Luke chapter 21, he references in kind of a general way the fact that there's going to be an army come in and it's going to create destruction there in the city. But he doesn't really focus in on that question. His focus is the last two questions. What will be the sign of your coming and what will be the sign of the end of the age? Now, think carefully with me here, folks. In the mind of a disciple, or a Jew for that matter, any Jew, when they thought about the Messiah returning and coming to this earth, what was the primary thought in their mind? What were they looking forward to when the Messiah came? Okay, yeah, deliverance from, from the people that were oppressing them, but even more importantly, they're thinking about these promises that God made to Abraham, right? This covenant of the land, the people, and the blessing, and, and that he would come in and he would establish his kingdom here on earth, and those promises would be fulfilled. All right? All right? Some of you are looking at me as a day's figure. Turn over to Acts chapter 1. You can see that this is exactly what they were thinking. In Acts chapter 1. So when you come to the book of Acts, the crucifixion has already taken place. The resurrection has taken place. Jesus has spent some time with his disciples here. He's about to return into heaven, and they make this statement in verse 6. Somebody read Acts chapter 1, verse 6. And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Okay, do you hear that? Okay, you've just risen from the dead. Are you now going to restore the kingdom? Are you going to bring in the promises that all the prophets had talked about in the Old Testament and establish your kingdom here on earth? That's what's first and foremost in their mind. Now, go back to Matthew chapter 23. The reason why I'm emphasizing this, folks, is if you don't understand that, you're going to get confused with what Jesus Christ is talking about here in chapter 24 and 25. Because there is another event that the Bible talks about in terms of the return of Jesus Christ, and Bible scholars often refer to it as the rapture. And we're going to take just a few minutes at the end of our time today to talk about this event. But you have to distinguish between the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So often when people read Matthew chapter 24 and 25, they are thinking that Jesus Christ is talking about the events that are leading up to the rapture. That's not what he's talking about here. They ask him, what are the signs of your coming and of the end of the age when you're going to establish your kingdom? The disciples don't know anything about the rapture yet. 
They don't even know much about this thing called the church age that's about to take place. They just are concerned about when he's going to come and establish his kingdom and fulfill the promises that God made to Abraham. You have to understand that, otherwise you're going to superimpose your thinking about the rapture and confuse what Jesus is saying here in terms of the events leading up to it. Because Matthew 24 and 25 talk about the events that lead up to his second coming. But it's the second coming, not the rapture, okay? Now, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus Christ is answering their question here. He's talking about these signs leading up to the end of the age. And he uses a variety of words to describe what these years are going to be like. Um, he talks about suffering. He talks about persecution. He talks about horror, uh, difficulties. But there's one word in particular that he uses that Bible scholars have used to describe this time period. And I just want you to see this. So um, Kevin's going to read a few verses from Kevin or Kelly. I'm going to read a few verses from Matthew chapter 24. The first one's going to be from verse 9. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Okay, so that verse uses persecution. Some of your Bibles might use the word tribulation or something else. Uh, read verse 21, Kevin. For then there will be a great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now. And okay. never to be equaled again. All right. Use the word distress. All right. And read verse 29. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the skies, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Okay. Immediately after the distress of those days. So Jesus is saying that these last years leading up to his second coming are going to be a time of distress and persecution and tribulation and horror. Some of your Bibles would use different translations like that. Okay, you get the idea? And then he's going to talk about some of the specific things that take place. Now, here's what we're going to do. Next week, we're going to come back to Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to look through it verse by verse and take a look at these different events. But what I want to do this morning is I want to go to a prophecy in the Old Testament that makes an amazing statement about the coming Messiah and this time period right before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? So turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. <clears throat> Those Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, historically speaking, Daniel is in Babylon. He's, he's part of that captivity that took place when Nebuchadnezzar came and conquered the two southern tribes in 605 B.C., um, but you probably know enough about Daniel to know that God has used him in positions of power and authority in the political realm as well, even though he's, he's been captured. But, but he's in captivity right now, all right, here in Daniel. And Daniel comes to understand through reading the book of Jeremiah that this captivity that they're in has a time limit to it. And the time limit is only 70 years. And so he's wondering, they're getting kind of near the end of those 70 years. He's wondering, okay, God, what's the plan now? Somebody read chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Okay, it says in the first year of Darius... Uh, we know from historical records that that was about 538 B.C. So the captivity began in 605 B.C. God said it was going to last 70 years. You were 70 years from 605. You end up at 535. And right here it's 538. So we're about three years ahead of the end of the captivity, right? And Daniel comes to understand that, that it's supposed to last 70 years long, and he's wondering, okay, what happens now? And he begins to pray to God, saying, God, what is your plan for Abraham's descendants at this point? And we don't have time to look at the whole prayer, but it's a wonderful prayer in which he confesses his sins and the sins of the whole 
nation and he says, God, you are absolutely right in what you did. You said that if we disobeyed, you were going to discipline us, and that's what you did. I understand that you're faithful, you're true. But the captivity is about over now, God, so what's your plan? So God sends him a messenger with a plan. Somebody read chapter 9, verses 20 through 23. Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. And he gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplication, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you were highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Okay, it's a great reminder of the value of prayer, that you and I have an opportunity to walk right into the presence of God, to talk to him, and to wait to hear his answer. It's just that you and I would love to have a personal messenger angel come and give us the answer every time, right? That doesn't usually happen. Although God can use angels in a variety of forms to give us answers. Um, but in this case, he sends Gabriel, the angel, directly to Daniel with his plan for the nation of Israel. Now, here's what I would like to do. We're going to have somebody read verses 24 through 27 in their entirety so you get an idea of what the plan is. And then we're going to go back and we're going to tear it apart verse by verse, okay? So somebody read chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Keep in mind that this is about 538 B.C. We're 540 years before Christ. All right. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and seventy or sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with cities and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. All right. That's the plan. God says, this is what I have for your people. And he begins by saying, 70 sevens have been decreed. Or some of your Bibles maybe say 70 weeks. Literally in the Hebrew, it's just 70 sevens. 70 units of seven. And they can be either days, those units of seven can represent days, so it would be seven days, or they can represent years, so it would be seven years, 70 units of seven years. And you have to make an interpretive decision on this call. I think he's talking about 70 units of seven years each. And one of the reasons why I believe that is because when Daniel wants us to understand that he's talking about days, he specifically puts the word days in there. If you jump over to chapter 10, verse 3, you'll see this. You won't see it in your Bible, but it's in the Hebrew. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 3, Daniel says, I did not eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all, until the entire three weeks were completed. The Hebrew says, until three sevens, identical phrase as chapter 9, three sevens, only this time Daniel adds three sevens of days. He specifically wants us to know that he's talking about three units of seven days each. So we're talking about 21 days or three weeks, right? But here in chapter 9, he just says 70 sevens. So let's assume that we're talking years and let's see how this works out, okay? He says, I have 70 units of seven that have been decreed for who? For your people, right? Who's your people? 
These are the Jews. This is Israel. God's saying, this plan that I'm going to propose is for the people of Israel. Nobody else. And then he says, when you come to the end of this plan, this is where we're going to be. This is the result. And he mentions, he makes six statements. To finish the transgression, in other words, to deal with Israel's rebellion against their Messiah, uh, to make an end of sin, same type of deal, to make atonement for iniquity, that's looking forward to the fact that Jesus Christ is going to pay the forgiveness of sins, to bring in everlasting righteousness. This is something that the writers, the Old Testament writers, talked about when the when the Messiah was going to come, he was going to rule with righteousness and justice and peace that during the kingdom to seal up vision and prophecy. So he's going to bring an end to prophecy and vision that won't be needed anymore because the Messiah is going to be sitting as king over the earth and all those prophecies that have been made, they're going to be sealed up, they're going to be fulfilled and accomplished. And then he says to anoint the most holy place, which most people take as a reference to the fact that the Messiah is going to be enthroned as king in that kingdom. He says, when you get to the end of this plan, these are the things that are going to have taken place. And then he begins to tear it apart bit by bit. So in verse 25, he says, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks and it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. So, he says the beginning point of this 70 units of seven is this decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. If we can determine when that decree took place, then we can find out if this is an accurate prophecy, because we have a pretty good idea when Messiah the Prince presented himself as their Messiah, and when he was killed. He was killed on April 3rd, 33 A.D. Okay? And he says, so the first question you have to ask is, when did that decree take place? Um, hold your fingers here in Daniel chapter 9 and go back to the book of Nehemiah. Gabriel is telling Daniel that if you can figure out when this decree takes place, then beginning at that point, there will be seven units of seven and 62 units of seven. So there will be a total of 69 units of seven used up in this plan that God has for the nation of Israel. You following me? Okay. Um, Nehemiah is kind of in the middle of the Old Testament. But if you remember the story that we gave the first week, you know that the story comes right at the end of the Old Testament. And uh, he's a cupbearer to the king. And God uses him to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Remember that story? He did it in 52 days. Okay, somebody read Nehemiah chapter 1, verses uh, 1 through 3. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Chislaz, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, him and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who have survived the exile are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Okay, so Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king. He's living in Susa, the capital over here. A lot of the Jews have already gone back because the captivity is over by this point. But one of his brothers comes back to Susa and he asks him, how are things back in Jerusalem? And he says, the people are in distress the walls are torn down, the gates have been burned, uh, so forth and so on. In that day and age, if the walls of your city were torn down, you were in a predicament because there was very little security or, or protection from marauding bands of robbers that might want to come through and create havoc in your city. So Nehemiah begins to pray. And we don't have time to look at this prayer either, but as he prays, he becomes convinced that God wants him to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls of the city. Okay, turn over to chapter 2 now, verse 1. Somebody read chapter 2, verse 1 uh, through verse 3. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, what, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but a sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. 
Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Okay, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, the king had enough worries and concerns um, to be concerned about. He didn't need his attendants and his advisors uh, unloading their burdens on him. And so they had a law that said if you came into the king's presence and you were sad and you began to unload your burdens on the king and he didn't like that, he could have you executed right there on the spot. So that's why in verse 2 it says Daniel was very much afraid because the king had noticed that he was sad. But Nehemiah goes ahead anyway and he says, you know what? This is my situation. And he explains to the king what's going on in terms of Jerusalem being torn down. Now, somebody read verses 4 through 8. See how the king responds. Then the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. And I said to the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river, that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates for the fortress, which is by the temple for the wall of the city and for the house which I will go. And the king granted to them, to me, because the good hand of my God was on me. Because the good hand of my God was on me. De Nehemiah recognizes that he had experienced favor in the king's eyes because God was at work. That's a good recognition on uh, Nehemiah's part. But that's the decree right there. The decree by Artaxerxes giving Nehemiah permission to go back and rebuild the walls in the city of Jerusalem. Now, kings didn't normally do this kind of thing because Jerusalem had been a major military power years before. Why give them the chance to once again become a great military power and then have to go defeat them? They've got the walls rebuilt, right? But he tells Nehemiah, you can go do that. That's the decree. So the question is, when was it given? Well, it says in verse 1, it was given in the month of Nisan, which would be our March, okay, early springtime, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Now, we know from archaeological and historical records that Artaxerxes began his reign in 464 B.C. So if this is his 20th year, this would be 444 B.C., right? Remember, this is B.C. You've got to go the other way. 440 B.C. So this decree was given in March 444 B.C. Now, go back to Daniel chapter 9. Gabriel had told Daniel that once you have the decree, there would be seven units of seven, and then there would be 69, 62 units of seven for a total of 69, right? If each unit represents seven years, then you would take 69, you would multiply it times seven, and you would end up with what number? Mathematicians? 483 years, right? So you should be able to start at 444 B.C., add on 483 years and come to Messiah the Prince. But if your math calculator is working well, you know that you end up about 39 A.D. But Jesus Christ died in 33 A.D. We're off about six years. So this is another one of those places where you just need to tear the page out of your Bible. There's problems here. <laughs> now, the solution is understanding the kind of calendars that they used back in that day and age, all right? You and I operate by what kind of a calendar? What do we call it? Gregorian solar calendar, all right? 365 days, five days, five hours, uh, what, 48 minutes, 46 seconds, something like that. That's the solar calendar that we operate by. But we have good evidence from archaeological records that oftentimes folks in Persia and India and um, Egypt, those kind of places, even in South America, such as Chile, um, operated by a lunar calendar. A lunar calendar operates by the moon, 30 days a month, so they have 360 days a year. In fact, even the Islamic calendar today, uh, many people in, in the Islamic religion operate by a lunar calendar, 30 days a month, 
and then from time to time they calculate more days to kind of keep up to date with, with where we're at. So um, this is a kind of calendar that they often use. In fact, you find a lunar calendar used in the Bible frequently. If you go back to Genesis, don't go back there now, but if you go sometime and read Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, where God is talking about the flood that took place, he talks about it lasting five months or 150 days. That would be 30 days a month, five months, uh, that's, that's your lunar calendar. It's also referenced in the book of Revelation when the, the writer John is talking about this final world ruler and how he's going to rule this world for the last three and a half years, or he says 42 months or 1,260 days. That is a lunar calendar, 30 days a month for three and a half years. So you see this from time to time, both in the Bible and in terms of different cultures. And that's exactly what's happening here. Gabriel is using the lunar calendar. Now, I have not done these calculations, so don't sit there and drop your jaw when we talk about them. There's a fellow by the name of Sir Robert Anderson, and uh, one of my professors at Dallas Seminary, his name was Dr. Harold Honer, they have done the calculations. And they have said what you have to do is you have to take these 483 years and you have to multiply them times 360 days per year because that's the lunar calendar, right? And then you end up with 173,880 days. So if this prophecy is accurate, there should be 173,880 days between the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Now, we know that Jesus Christ was killed on April 3rd, 33 AD. So if you go back five days, on March 29th of 33 AD, Jesus Christ officially presents himself to the nation as their Messiah. You remember what he did? He came riding into Jerusalem on a four-wheeler, right? <laughs> on the back of a colt. And the people recognized him as the Messiah. They cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We refer to that as Palm Sunday, right? That was his triumphal entry, and he was saying, I'm your king. And a lot of the people recognized him as their king. It's just that the religious leaders didn't. And they said, we've got to put a stop to this nonsense. And so they did. Five days later, he was killed. But if you take that date, March 29th, where he officially presents himself as Messiah the Prince, and you go back 173,880 days, you end up at March 5th, 444 B.C. Precisely what Gabriel had told Daniel was God's plan for the nation of Israel. And then he says, did you see that in verse 26? He says, after that, after the 62 weeks, or after that 69th total, after that the Messiah will be what? Cut off. That word in the Hebrew, whenever it is used in this kind of construction, it always means death by execution. Gabriel is predicting 570-some years before it happens that this Messiah that's going to come as their king was going to be killed, and it wouldn't be just an ordinary death. He was going to be executed. That's exactly what happened. He presents himself as their king. Five days later, he's cut off. He's executed. By the way, this is why Jesus Christ, when he was talking to his disciples and he was trying to explain to them that the Messiah, first of all, had to die, and they didn't understand that, and he looked at them and says, why don't you understand it? He's saying you should have known it because it was predicted in the Old Testament. That's why when you read your Bibles, folks, you need to read it really carefully, study it. But he had predicted that that was the very thing that was going to happen. He says he's going to be cut off, and then it says he's going to have nothing. He came to claim the kingship, but he's not going to have it. Same thing that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, right? Behold, your house is being left desolate, empty, barren, until someday I come in the future. Um, and then he goes on, he says, and the people, and then he kind of puts in this parenthetical statement of the prince who is to come, but the people will destroy the city and the sanctuary. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, right? The city. This is, this is a plan for Israel. 
the destruction of the city and the sanctuary, that would be the temple. And then he says, and its end, the end of what? The end of this plan will come with like a flood, even to the end there will be wars and desolations are determined. And if you follow this out, folks, you find that this is exactly what happened. Jesus Christ was crucified after that 69th unit of seven. In 70 AD, the Roman general Titus came and destroyed the city and the temple. And ever since then, the nation of Israel has been experiencing wars and desolations. In fact, Josephus tells us that two years after Titus destroyed the city in 70 AD, the Romans came back, and this time they just slaughtered the Jews. And then after the Romans were in charge, then the Moslems became in control of the land of Palestine. They weren't friends of the Jews. They created problems for the Jews. After the Moslems come the Crusaders. The Crusaders, remember, were going to come down from Europe, and they were going to wrestle this land away from the infidels. But what I didn't tell you a couple of weeks ago is that when they came through Europe to go down to the Holy Land, they thought to themselves, if we do conquer the Moslems, then the Jews are going to say, hey, that's our land, give it back to us. But the Crusaders didn't want to give it back to the Jews. So on their way through Europe, the Crusaders slaughtered the Jews by the thousands. In fact, it got worse during the Second Crusade. And then the Black Plague hits Europe and the Jews get blamed for the Black Plague. And then Hitler comes on the scene and he's going to create his superior race, right? Who needs to be exterminated? The Jews. And even today, the Jews are back in their land. But are they living in a great deal of peace? No. Wars and conflicts, Gabriel says, will happen until the end. Suicide bombings, missile attacks, constant threat of war. Gabriel predicted this way back 500 years before Christ came on the scene. And it's happening just like he said it would. Now, folks, what I want you to see here, and don't miss this, okay, he says, after the 62 weeks, he is saying, after the Messiah is cut off and have nothing, there's going to be some things that are going to happen here. After that 69th week, the Messiah is going to get cut off, and then the city is going to be destroyed. That's in 70 A.D. So we have a gap. What I'm trying to say here is we have a gap between the 69th unit of seven and the 70th unit of seven. We know that that gap has to be at least 37 years, right? Because Jesus Christ was crucified in 33 A.D. and the city was destroyed in 70 A.D. So we know there has to be at least that much of a gap. But then he says the end will come after wars and desolations. And what I want you to see, folks, is that that gap continues even today. You and I are living in this gap because that seventh unit, a 70th unit of seven hasn't taken place yet. He's going to talk about it in just a minute here, okay? But I want you to catch this, that the end of the 69 units happens, and then there's his death, then the city's destroyed, and then there's wars and desolations. Daniel did not know that there was going to be this massive gap between the 69th seven and the 70th seven. I don't think the disciples understood this gap when Jesus was talking about him, because that gap is what you and I know of as the church age. It is the day and age in which we live. The Jews had no comprehension that God was going to go to the Gentiles after the death of the Messiah. How many of you have gone on a vacation and you have been sitting beside a nice little um, mountain lake and off behind the mountain lake is this beautiful snow-capped mountain? And you have found yourself thinking, wow, wouldn't it be fun to go climb that mountain? You ever thought something like that? Ever tried to do something like that? In my younger days, I did. What I didn't realize is there's a lot of valleys in between that lake and where that mountaintop was. We gave up after the first mountaintop. We went back. That's a little bit what's happening here, folks, is God is giving Daniel a picture of his plan for the nation of Israel, and he lets him look off into the 69th unit of seven, and then he lets him look even further to the 70th unit of seven, but he doesn't see that there's a great big valley and gap in between the 69th and the 70th, and you and I are living in that gap. All right? You say, where does that 70th unit of seven come into play? Well, 
It's in verse 27. In Daniel chapter 9, he says, And he, now you're going to have to take this by faith, folks, because we don't have time to go back and prove it here this morning, but the he is a reference to that guy back in verse 26, who is the prince who is to come. And this guy is the final world ruler. We're going to talk about him a little bit more next week. It says, And he will make a firm covenant with the many. Who are the many? Well, who are we talking about? The Jews, right? So most Bible scholars believe that this is going to be the majority of the Jews who are going to make an agreement with this individual. Most Bible scholars believe that by the time you come to this point in world history, the Jews are going to find themselves in a situation where they don't have very many friends and they realize that they're in danger. It's not a whole lot different than what they are right now today, huh? And so this guy is going to offer them some kind of an, an agreement, some kind of a peace treaty that's going to offer them some protection, and the majority of the Jews are going to say, yes, let's do it. Okay? When that happens, that is going to be the beginning of this final unit of seven. But now look what happens. It says, but in the middle of that seven, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. The book of Revelation tells us that during this time period leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ, there will be a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount. Now, I know right now that looks impossible with the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque there, okay? But the Bible says it's going to happen. So I believe the Bible. And he's going to allow the Jews to carry out their sacrificial system. But in the middle of this seven, which would be three and a half years into it, right? In the middle of the seven, he's going to put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And then it says, and on a wing of the temple, there's going to be an abomination that makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, Gabriel does not tell us what this man is going to do. He simply says that he's going to do something abominable that's going to create desolation. And then, until the end, you're going to have destruction. Got that? So Daniel comes to God, and he says, listen, our captivity is about old or over. What's your plan for us? And God sends him Gabriel and says, Daniel, my plan encompasses 70 units of seven. Each unit represents seven years. When the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem takes place, then 69 units of seven will occur between that decree and Messiah the Prince. So Jesus Christ came, he presented himself, and then Gabriel says after that, and you and I know there was five days later, he will be cut off. He was executed. And then the city is going to be destroyed along with the temple. There's going to be wars and desolations. And then at the end, there's going to be your final unit of seven. And in the middle of that unit of seven, this man's going to do something that creates desolation, something terrible. Got the plan? That's an amazing prophecy, folks. Right there, you have a number of things that God predicts that came true, just like he said that they would. Over 300 prophecies Jesus Christ fulfilled perfectly in his life. Now, go back to Matthew chapter 24. I want to tie... Matthew chapter 24 in with this prophecy that Daniel has just given us. You remember, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is answering his disciples' questions, said, hey, when, what will be the signs of your coming, and what will be the signs of the end of the age, when you're going to come and establish your kingdom on earth, right? That's his question. He's answering right here. And he makes this statement in verse 15. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through who? Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. That would be what? They're in the temple. Then he says, let the reader understand. Jesus is referencing that prediction that Gabriel made to Daniel back in Daniel chapter 9, that in that final unit of seven, this individual is going to do something abominable. And Jesus is saying, listen, when you see that take place, then look out. And we're going to take a look at this next week 
as we look at some of these events, everything's going to hit the fan at this point, folks, because the Bible makes it clear that God gives this ruler extreme power and authority during those last three and a half years of that unit of seven. And life is going to get to be pretty tough during those years. Well, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. Now, Daniel does not tell us what this guy is going to do, and Jesus doesn't tell us what this guy is going to do. That's an abominable thing, okay? But I think the Apostle Paul does tell us what he's going to do. So turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, I want you to know that we are taking a stab at this, all right? I am not saying that this is exactly what he's going to do, but because Paul does not specifically say this is the abominable thing, but I think after you, you read this, you're going to understand why I'm saying this. Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, um, again, you're going to have to take this by faith. We're going to see this next week, that this man that Paul's talking about is the final world ruler. And what has happened is this. The believers in Thessalonica have somehow become deceived into thinking that they are already living during these last seven years, right before the second return of Jesus Christ. And they're talking to Paul, what's going on here? And Paul writes them and says, no, no, it hasn't happened yet. Don't get all worked up. Stay calm. Those years, that time period, it's called the day of the Lord. It can't happen until the world revolts against God and this final world ruler is exposed. Okay? That's what he's saying here. We're kind of jumping right into the middle of the conversation. So now with that in mind, uh, somebody read chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and see what Paul says about this guy. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Okay. He will take his seat where? It's getting late, folks. I realize that. It's, he will take his seat where? You have to see this. In the temple. And he will display himself as being what? God. Paul says this man is going to go into the temple and he's going to declare himself to be God He's going to demand to be worshipped as God. That's why Gabriel tells Daniel he's going to put a stop to sacrifices and grain offerings because he doesn't want them worshipping the true God. He wants them worshipping himself. And if you know your Bible well, you know that this man is energized. We're going to see this next week. This man is energized and he is empowered by none other than Satan himself. And if you know your Bible really well, you know that one of Satan's greatest desires in life is that he be the king of this world and he be worshipped as God. And so Satan is going to use this man to try to get the worship of the world to worship him as God. And we're going to see this next week, that if you choose not to worship him, um, your life is over. Not a whole lot different than what we're finding in the Middle East if you don't happen to agree to be part of the Islamic religion. Um, so let's summarize what we have said so far. We have said that the Abrahamic covenant is going to be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then we've asked the question, does the Bible talk to us about some of these events that lead up to that second coming? And so we went back to the book of Daniel where Daniel asks God, okay, what's your plan for our nation? And God says, I have a plan. It encompasses 70 units of seven. 69 units of seven have already been completed because they went from the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. And then after that, there's going to be his death, the destruction of the city, and then wars and desolations, a gap that Daniel did not understand, but you and I understand it now. It's called the church age. The 70th unit of seven is still in the future. And that's going to take place when this man comes on the world scene and he makes this agreement with the nation of Israel. But in the middle of that seven, he's going to stop the sacrifices and the grain offerings and he's going to demand that he be worshipped as God. Excuse me. I should say that last little bit is 
Maybe that's what he's going to do, okay? Because Paul does not specifically say it's the abomination that creates desolation, and Jesus and Daniel don't specifically say that he's going to do that. But I think there's pretty good argumentation for that, all right? That's, that's the prophecy that Gabriel gives Daniel laying out this plan for the nation of Israel. Folks, it's an amazing prophecy, particularly when you and I can look back and see how it's been fulfilled so accurately up until this point. And if God was able to create perfect fulfillment in 69 units of seven, what's the chance that he can fulfill that last unit of seven? I'd say it's 100%. Now, there's another event where Jesus Christ comes out of heaven that people often confuse with this second coming. It's really not part of the study here this morning, but I want to spend just a few minutes talking about it so that you understand the differences between the two. So if you're in 2 Thessalonians, just turn back a few pages to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, because in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul talks about this event. Uh, you and I refer to it as the rapture event. The, the main distinguishing feature between the second coming of Christ and the rapture is that in the second coming, Jesus comes all the way down to the earth and his feet land on the Mount of Olives. Remember we read that back in Zechariah chapter 14? But in the rapture, he doesn't come all the way to the earth. He comes into the air and he meets us in the clouds and he takes us as his bride, his church, to be with him back in heaven. And then these last seven years take place in which God deals specifically with the Jews and this unbelieving world that has rejected him, okay? It is this event that Paul is talking about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So somebody uh, read verses 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with you Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in him. Okay. That's, that's a, when it says fallen asleep, that's a Greek euphemism for dying, all right? So apparently what's happened is some of these believers have died, and so they have talked to Paul, and they said, Paul, what's going on here? You know, you told us to look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, but he hasn't come, and our brothers and sisters have died. W what's the deal here? And Paul says, hey, take it easy. He says, we know that Jesus Christ died, and he rose from the dead, and because he was resurrected from the dead, we know that our brothers and sisters someday will be resurrected from the dead, too. The grave is not the end of the story, all right? That, that's what he's saying here. So you and I, when we lose a brother or sister in Christ, there's grief because there's loss, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We have a hope. It's the hope of the resurrection. All right, go ahead, McKenna, and read 15 and 16. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, so what Paul does here is he's spelling out the specifics of what's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns here. And he says, we who are alive will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Who are the dead in Christ? Yeah, it's not the Presbyterians. <laughs> it's not the Methodists, all right? The dead in Christ are those who died, but they were in relationship with Christ. They had acknowledged their sinfulness, that they needed a Savior, the very thing we talked about last week. They had put their faith and their trust in him and received the forgiveness of sins and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and this personal relationship with God. Those people are in Christ. When you die and you're in Christ, those people's bodies will be resurrected first. They will be brought up out of the ground. And then those of us who are alive will join them in the sky. That's what it says in verse 17, right? Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. Where? In the air. Don't miss that. He's not coming to the earth at this meeting. He's going to meet us in the air, and then we will be with him forever. That's the distinguishing feature of the rapture event. Now, a lot of people look at this and they say, well, see, you don't see the word rapture here. How in the world can you teach this thing called the rapture? The Bible doesn't even talk about the rapture. And they're right. The word rapture is not in the Bible. 
But here's the deal. There were some people that understood Latin better than they stood Greek. So they wanted to take the Greek New Testament and translate it into Latin. And when they translated it into Latin, and they came to this phrase, caught up together with them, they used the Latin word rapturo. And you know this, right? Uh, lawyers, doctors, scientists, other people, when they want to give names or titles to things, they love to use Latin words because sometimes it just fits, right? Plus, it sounds good to use Latin, I think. Um, so these biblical scholars said, well, let's call this the rapture event, using the Latin word rapturo when it was translated from Greek into Latin. So yes, the, the word rapture is not in your text. It's not there, but it's taught. That's what the word means, to be caught up together with them. It means to snatch quickly. I've never been a purse thief, but if you're a purse thief, I think that's what you want to do, right? You want to snatch it fast and get out of there. And in the parallel passage to this event, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul tells us that this event's going to happen fast. He says, in the twinkling of an eye. So Jesus Christ is going to come. The dead in Christ are going to be resurrected. Then you and I are going to be taken up, caught up, off the earth. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. Um, yes, amen. That's a wonderful thing to look forward to. Anyway, um, what you also need to know, folks, is that prophetically speaking, there's nothing else that needs to take place before this event. So the next thing that you and I are waiting for is the rapture. And this is why the writers of the Bible refer to this as the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Imminent meaning it could happen at any time. And this is why the writers of the New Testament say it could happen today. Now, they were living back, you know, a few years after Jesus Christ, saying it could happen today. And you and I have a tendency to say, you know what, it's been almost 2,000 years, and it hasn't happened. So, hmm, it's going to be a long time. And we lose our focus. But the truth is, folks, it could happen this afternoon. It could happen tomorrow. Now, I know it may not happen for another 500 years, but the truth is it could happen. And you look at the world where it's at today, and it's not that hard to realize that we're that close. The nation of Israel is back in the land. They're experiencing all kinds of conflict and turmoil. You take all the believers off the earth, they're going to need help of some sort. It's going to be a prime opportunity for somebody to step onto the world scene and say, hey, I know what to do. Listen to me. And the world will say, hey, we're going with you. Now, there's some great applications for you and me, folks. The first one's this. You and I need to be ready. If Jesus Christ were to come tonight, you and I need to be in right relationship with him. We talked about that last week. Understanding our sinfulness, putting our trust in him as our personal savior. Another application is, is that if you've lost a loved one and they had put their faith in Jesus Christ, then there may be sadness and there may be sorrow, but it's not a sorrow of hopelessness. Because based upon the promise of God's word, we know that someday we will see that loved one again. There'll be a grand reunion with them in heaven when Jesus Christ returns. So just like Paul says in verse 18, he says these words should be a great encouragement to us, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18, he says, Therefore comfort or encourage one another with these words. You can look at the world system today and you can see the chaos, you can see the mess, you can see people rebelling and shaking their fist at God and going their own direction, and it seems to be going downhill. And it's easy for the enemy to come to us and want us to live in despair and hopelessness and, oh man, what's the use? And Paul says, no, you be encouraged by these words that someday Jesus Christ is going to return. He's going to take us to be with him, and we will be with him forever. 
what a wonderful thing for you and I to live our lives by day by day by day, saying, you know what, when you wake up in the morning, it could be today. And live each day with that understanding, Lord, it could be today. And I want to live my life so that if you were to come today, I want you to find me doing what brings great pleasure and smile to your face. But God, I know you're coming, so I'm going to live today with that understanding. What a great, great way to live life.